Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Yeah, of course, thanks to the organizers. Um, um, uh, Pradeek and Indrajit have put in a lot of work uh, trying to get this going. So I hope I get this going and not um, get it stuck, but we'll see. Um, uh, as he said, there is an audience consisting of uh, you know, machine learning people as well as TCS people. So I have addressed my talk to perhaps both of, both of them, and hopefully there'll be something new to give each of you. This is supposed to be a tutorial. Uh, then I looked at the audience and I realized they're all experts. There's no point giving a basic tutorial to experts, so you will see the clash in the talk. Sometimes it's basic, but I hope I put in something new to people uh, like you who already know the stuff. So the talk is on clustering. Uh, the clustering problem, uh, all of you know probably, but just to uh, get our bearings, given a set of n objects, and you might be given pairwise distances between the objects. On the other hand, you might be given similarities. So either, either is possible. We want to partition the objects into k clusters, and a cluster should contain, if it was distances, nearby objects. Distances, you can think of dissimilarities. So a cluster should contain objects that are not so dissimilar. If it's similarity, you want to maximize what's inside the cluster, right? Um, for much of the talk, although I'll touch on the similarity part as well towards the end, for much of the talk, uh, objects are just going to be points in Euclidean D space and distances are Euclidean, right? Just very simple uh, setup. Somebody, basically uh, perhaps the domain expert or the machine learning person has already embedded the problem in uh, D dimensional space, given you features and what have you, the feature vectors are given to you, and you, we are only going to deal with this geometric problem for much of the talk. And also for much of the talk, uh, n and d are large. The number of dimensions and the number of points are large. The number of clusters is small, is constant. Now, I won't introduce too many uh, parameters that you have to remember that, that will be taxing, but d for dimension and k for the number of clusters, probably two things that will be good to remember, but I, I'll repeat them if necessary. That's the only notation we need. And uh, even simple versions of this are NP-hard, even for k equals 2, I won't um, uh, go over the proofs anyway, but it just indicates that the problem is hard, right? In general, the problem is hard to solve in the worst case. Uh, so, however, uh, there are algorithms and heuristics, and probably Lloyd's algorithm, which is um, sometimes, I, I guess in a way it's a misnomer, but it's came to come to stick, it's called the k-means algorithm, although k-means is the criterion that Lloyd's algorithm is trying to optimize. Again, probably all of you know that, but just to recap, uh, what's Lloyd's algorithm? You want to cluster uh, n points in d space into k clusters, the algorithm says, start with a proposed set of centers of those clusters. So we start with k points, which we assume are the or, or the starting cluster centers, you partition data into k clusters based on which center, which current center it's closest to, and then recompute the cluster center as the centroid of the new cluster. And you repeat, and I'm going to give you a picture. Now, at this point, uh, usually I have some jokes on machine learning people, but I, I won't do that at this <laughs> obvious thing, obviously. But, uh, but I'll keep the jokes on my own field, which is algorithms, which, which I will crack later. So it's not just ML, but. Uh, so, people in machine learning, this is of course an exaggeration, use it and they're happy, but the theoreticians are not happy because apparently we can't prove so much about the k-means algorithm. Uh, well, we can prove one thing, which is uh, right on this slide. So let's take the mean squared distance of the points to the cluster center. The claim is that monotonically improves. That's not difficult to see, and next slide I'll show you a picture. And therefore, there is convergence, it's a bounded decreasing sequence, it's convergence, and converges to something. And that something may not make sense. We'll see uh, a good example where it doesn't make, make sense. Again, to fix our bearing here is the step of Lloyd's algorithm in one picture. So, <coughs> uh, this green, this red, and this yellow were the three current centers I had. Then I took all the points and colored them green, red, or yellow, depending on which one it's closest to. All these points and this are closest to that. All these points are closest to that, and so on. 
uh, and then I computed the centroid of the new set. So the centroid moves to that is here, here, and there. So we move the move the centers to those points. It's easy to see that the mean squared distance improves in both these steps, the recomputation as well as uh, reassignment. Okay. Now, also, it's uh, something that again people are quite aware of here. I'm sure that if you start off the Lloyd's algorithm or K-means algorithm badly, you're sunk. So here's a good, a simple example. There are three clouds of points. Obviously, there should be in these three clusters, red, uh, green, and blue. If you happen to start with two of your starting centers in inside one cluster and the other one between the two, that's a black start, right? Those are the three starting points. You can convince yourself that you'll never get out of that mess. You'll never get two different centers for this and one for this, right? So just, you can run a few steps of the uh, Lloyd's algorithm and see that you're stuck, stuck forever. However, if you had a better start, this, this, and this, then you, you'll be home, you'll get good, um, uh, or they don't have to be right there, they have to be somewhere here. Now there is going to be another talk by Jeswal this afternoon, I believe, on, uh, uh, on starting points for k-means. So it's a topic that people have worked on. I won't say a lot more about it, but indeed, if you start badly, you, you can be sunk, right? Now, on the other hand, as I said earlier, people are happily solving clustering problems. Why are many clustering problems easy? I'm going to attempt, the literature has attempted two explanations for it, uh, and I'll try to say what's good and bad about the explanations, and perhaps then we'll get, we'll get towards the end of the talk something that, that actually meets or does away with many of the objections. So one explanation for why clustering problems are very easy perhaps in practice, even though in theory they are hard, is that the problems that you encounter in practice might have a very, very unique solution. What does that mean? That means perhaps there is a correct clustering that you're aiming to get and every nearly optimal clustering is very close to the correct one. Uh, optimal with respect to some criterion. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what the criteria are, are a little later with respect to some criterion. And so if that number is one number, that criterion, that if you optimize that, you are guaranteed to be getting close to the really correct one that you're intending. This is not always true. I mean, you could have multiple optima, for instance. This is saying even near optima, there aren't so many. So quantified this way in the literature, you take, I'm going to um, repeat this phrase a few times, MSD is mean squared distance. You take the mean squared distance from the cluster center. So the assumption that people make is any clustering with mean squared distance at most 1 plus epsilon times the correct one is almost the correct one, is very close to the correct one. It differs from the correct one in only a small fraction. You can think of this as 10 epsilon. So if the mean squared distance is correct, the clustering itself is correct. That's, that's not always true. This is an assumption that you have to make. Uh, uh, so you assume a strongly unique clustering, and perhaps that's what makes it easy. So I, maybe I'll call this an elephant in a haystack instead of a needle in a haystack, because you know uh, it's a smooth haystack in the space of solutions, in the space of clusterings, not in the space. You're given space of clustering, smooth haystack, and there's one elephant sticking out, which is the optimal solution, and maybe that's why it's easy to find. And in fact, theoretically, it's been shown that you, if this assumption is valid, then you can find the, this optimal, uh, essentially unique clustering can be found very efficiently. So there are uh, several papers on this. Uh, I put down the names of the authors here, and probably I won't describe the papers in detail, but the idea is, again, to take home is that if there is a strongly unique clustering, that is, if you optimize mean squared distance, you've got the clustering, essentially then in fact you can find it if that assumption is valid. Okay? Uh, that's true, you can probably do this. Uh, such things are called uh, stability and it's being studied for not only clustering but for several problems. In fact, um, uh, <coughs> max cut is another problem. Uh, I won't describe the problem, that's not uh, the talk about it. It's splitting up the graph into two parts maximizing to maximize the number of edges going between the two parts. You can again formulate a uniqueness of optimal solution and show that under that you can find it. Okay, very good. So that seems to be a good explanation, except we'll see that it's not so reasonable. Is the unique solution assumption reasonable? So again, we assume 
that there is a correct clustering and everybody which is off by epsilon from the mean squared distance is off only by 10 epsilon in the num 10 epsilon n in the number of points. Is that reasonable? Is the focus optimizing it is? But in clustering it is not, I'm going to argue. In, uh, in the correct clustering distance squared between two clusters, so this implies that the distance squared between two clusters is at least the mean squared distance and this is too strong for Gaussians. Now I'm sure that uh, perhaps this slide didn't make it clear but I hope this picture will. So this is an important picture, although very simple, right? Uh, again, uh, I'm hoping that quite familiar to a lot of you. This is an important picture, I'll repeat this a couple of times. So here I've shown you two d-dimensional Gaussians on the board, centered at these two points. They are spherical Gaussians, so that's a level curve. So the standard deviation is the same in all directions. Let's say the standard deviation is same for both of them in all directions. Okay. Then you can show that points basically lie on the sphere, which is quite far away compared to the sigma. In fact, it's uh, mean squared distance is d sigma squared. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want, uh, I want to impress this picture on you, even though it's familiar for spherical Gaussians and we'll play with this. Uh, one, one mnemonic for this picture is it's as if Gaussians are like uh, uh, sun and stars, the sun is here, uh, sun and planets, sorry. And the planets are very far, they are really small compared to the distance away they are from the sun, right? So the distance, they are mean squared distance is d sigma squared. Okay. And there is a... Uh, um, uh, there is a spread here, which I'll come to in, another, in the next picture. So it's not exactly at this uh, periphery, it's a little bit of a thin annulus. And I'll come to how thin the annulus is. That's what you should think of as the Earth's uh, dimensions, right? The annulus. Uh, and, but the distance is v sigma squared. Now, if the two uh, centers are a few standard deviations apart, okay, then it's not difficult for you to convince yourself, you have to prove this, that in fact there's no confusion between the two uh, sam samples drawn from this and samples drawn from that. They will lie strictly on the two sides of this line. Okay? You have to argue this, but with Gaussians everything is concentrated, it's very easy to argue. that. They so if I knew this line, if I knew this hyperplane in high dimensions, I can split the two Gaussians. So there's no confusion as soon as the separation between the centers is a few standard deviations apart. right? But the mean squared distance is this much and the assumption is far, far from satisfied. It's not at all true that there's a unique near optimal clustering. I pay very little penalty for classifying these points with the other cluster. Okay? So if I'm only worried about optimal clustering, I'll go completely wrong, even for this very simple case. Okay? So that's not a reasonable assumption. Um, well, another explanation of why things are easy is uh, uh, from algorithmic point of view, it's mixture models, from statistics point of view, it's a way to formulate, it's a way to model reality. I'm going to dwell a little bit on mixture models for a few slides, so let me uh, um, um, define them. So, in a mixture model, uh, again, I'm hoping that it will be familiar to most of you, but uh, let's just get uh, the basics definition, right? So, K component probability densities, each component is a nice density, it's a Gaussian. Uh, or maybe it's a discrete thing, Bernoulli, random variables and so on, but it's very well distributed. Uh, F1 through Fk, let's think of them as densities and Gaussians here. Each data point is generated by the following process. We pick one of the k components, with, we, we have some weights, W1 through Wk, and those are the probabilities of picking the respective components. And then you generate a sample from the component you picked. If I picked F10, I generate a sample according to the probability density F10. Uh, it's easy to see that I'm really picking IID samples from this, which is the mixture. Uh, this is the density, of course, because the WI sum to 1, so that integrates to 1. So I'm picking from that. Uh, it's an important statistical model. Now, uh, what uh, TCS has been concerned with is trying to get probable results, trying to say, if this is my model of data, I can, in fact, cluster very quickly. Okay? Under some assumptions, we have to make some assumptions, we'll see. Uh, under some assumptions, we can cluster quickly. Okay? Now, unfortunately, it's always going to be the case that what you can prove as theorems are weaker than what ML people already knew a decade ago. But, but you know, I mean, or you assume in empirical evidence is much stronger than theory, but we can prove some things. And I will try to indicate uh, what it is that we can prove. Okay? Uh, this is just a picture of a mixture in case, I mean, this 
two densities half weight each and then I add up I get this this for the, on the real line okay okay so the question I like to focus so what's the salient question in this uh, topic on learning mixtures of probability densities the salient question is how many standard deviations are part of the means this is a basic familiar sounding statistics question but let me formulate this so in one dimension if you have two Gaussians of standard deviation one each uh, and if the intercenter separation is more than six standard deviations then you all heard and we know uh, we can prove this in one dimension easily that in fact the clusters are completely different and if it's if the intercenter separation is one sixth or less in the limit the two Gaussians sit on top of each other then you cannot cluster you cannot distinguish there's no way you can distinguish well if it's one sixth or less it's, it's getting confusing right so this is intuitively obvious so that you need uh, intercenter separation and what's more obvious is you must measure the intercenter separation in units of standard deviation that's all I'm trying to say here uh, that's quite obvious what I'm going to say next will also seem obvious but it wasn't so obvious to us in the uh, community it took a while so in d dimensions uh, there's a very nice result which I will now uh, tell you due to Vampala and Wang which says that we have k again constant number of spherical Gaussians of standard deviation one each in each direction and the intercenter separation is just a constant number of standard deviations is a high constant number of standard deviations for k constant it depends on k if that is enough to cluster each point separately again remember if the Gaussian sat on top of each other there's no way I can cluster the question I'm asking is how far apart should they be before I can cluster it turns out your one dimensional intuition of a, of a constant number of standard deviations is in fact valid in d dimensions as d grows okay. um, and uh, it uses singular value decomposition it's a beautiful simple argument which I'll tell you on the next slide and when I tell you that you say why didn't people realize this at, at the word go and apparently we didn't it took a while and uh, and I'll tell you some reasons why it took a while so this is really was uh, uh, built up and uh, several sort of papers later this came up um, and it answers the question how many standard deviations part must the beam be okay uh, let me tell you why it wasn't completely obvious and why it shouldn't just stare at your face uh, and I will have a slide and then a picture next explaining it so here is a very basic way of clustering distance space clustering I take one point one data point that's all I'm given I'm not given the centers right I'm not given the densities obviously that's what I'm trying to learn I pick up one data point and cluster everybody within a certain distance of it into one cluster how do we know delta is the first question can a single Gaussian have blank spaces and I'll uh, give you a picture for that but before that uh, we also don't know how do we know x naught which x naught to pick this won't work if you picked an arbitrary x naught but it turns the more fundamental worry now we are focused on at the moment is the intercenter separation sufficient okay so uh, here's this um, picture again uh, Okay, so now I put the most stuff in the picture right I mean there are still those two spherical Gaussians and now are these distances or distance squared what have I marked not distances right it says that so now this distance point A is picked from the first Gaussian point C from the next Gaussian point B also from the first Gaussian A and B from the first C from the second so the distance from the center to the uh, to the sample is D but has a variation of plus or minus root D you have to work this out but that turns out to be true similarly C from its center is D plus or minus root D okay. so I like to do distance based clustering A and B are from the same Gaussian C is from a different one okay. so I would like A and B to be closer than A and C let's see if that's true unfortunately it's not necessarily true so uh, uh, one thing about Gaussians that's nice to know is if I draw uh, I don't know 10 lines that have to do with Gaussians they're all perpendicular to each other okay for the talk let's just assume that uh, things are very concentrated around being orthogonal right so uh, the distance a b squared since we use Pythagoras because it's all perpendicular a b squared it'll go from a to the center center to b right and a c squared I go from a to the center and then the center to the next center that's how my epsilon squared and then that to C I want this to be less than this or I want this to be greater than that then epsilon squared has to be root D 
Okay? So I hope everybody got that. I won't do too many calculations, I promise, but this one is nice to know. So epsilon squared, the intercenter separation, has to be to root t. So it's not true that constant number of standard deviations suffices. We are needing a separation which grows with d in terms of standard deviation. Okay. So uh, this, in fact, uh, uh, well, there's the EM algorithm. It's the algorithm that uh, EM algorithm is what whatever statisticians use when they can't think of any other algorithm. It's just it's used for everything. It works actually quite, quite a lot of times. The expectation minimization algorithm, but it notoriously does not work very well on several clustering examples. There are quite a few examples known. However, Dasgupta and Shulman, in some sense, started the theoretical analysis or the provable analysis of this kind of clustering algorithm by showing that, in fact, this separation, which I indicated on the last slide, would be enough. Any questions? No. You can, um, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. You can also raise your hand if you don't have questions. But <laughs> so, um, and then uh, with Sanjeev Arora, I showed that, in fact, D to the one fourth type separation is enough for non spherical Gaussians too. And I won't uh, go into the proof of this, but I want to tell you the one technical or interesting fundamental issue that comes up here, and that is the following. So I'm doing distance based clustering, right? Setting a data point, looking at a certain distance from it, and saying I take everybody and put it in my sample. What can go wrong with that? One thing that can fundamentally go wrong with that is this picture. This is my Gaussian, but my data point was somewhere here. It's centered here. It's the center of those two, right? I'm going out from this. I found a bunch of points up to this, and then I get an annulus where I see no points. And then I say, OK, that cluster is done, and I stop. However, it turns out, quite a lot of this Gaussian's mass lies on that side. Okay. Another picture, same phenomenon. Another picture, right? Now I have a non-spherical Gaussian, makes life a little more complicated. Here we have spherical Gaussians and growing spheres, right? Distance-based clustering is growing spheres. So here I have non-spherical Gaussian, I'm growing spheres. Here is a spherical annulus. I've seen a bunch of points up to this, and I don't see anybody in the annulus, and I conclude the cluster is finished and I close it, but there are a lot of points there of the cluster. Can this happen? Now, intuitively, you would think it doesn't happen. It's not actually that easy to prove. Um, the way you prove that is, um, is using what's called isoperimetric inequalities. And basically, isoperimetry says the following. If I have this kind of annulus, where one-tenth of the probability mass lies on this side, one-tenth on the other side, then it cannot be empty. Okay? You can, in fact, prove that. It's not true for all densities. It's true for log concave densities. And Gaussian is logarithmically concave, so it's, it, it can be proved. Okay? But it requires some machinery. Okay, so that's uh, actually the one crucial issue there that needed to be tackled. Um, but I will now tell you this uh, very nice proof of Impala and Wang, where a uh, constant number of Gaussians, constant number of standard deviations suffice. So we actually had a few more steps in between that went from d to the one-fourth to some dependence on d less than that, and then finally we got to this. But only for spherical Gaussians. And again, the proof is relatively simple, so I can show you on one slide. Singular vectors and spherical Gaussians. So uh, um, recall uh, one line of linear algebra, which again is surely familiar to all of you. Uh, if I found the top k singular vectors of anything, of a bunch of vectors, they span the subspace of dimension k that minimizes the mean squared distance of the data points, right? I took n data points, I did SVD on the matrix consisting of them as rows, and among all k-dimensional subspaces, the one that minimizes the mean squared distance of data points is precisely the SVD subspace, right? We know that. So, um, simple fact one, for a spherical Gaussian with center mu, which is not zero, zero is a degenerate case, we won't, uh, so here's a picture then, Here's a Gaussian with center mu, and the origin is here. Okay. It, it, the assertion is the mean squared distance to the probability distribution or density is minimized precisely when your k-dimensional subspace passes through mu, contains mu. So every k-dimensional subspace containing mu has the least mean squared distance to the cloud. If it doesn't pass through mu, it has greater MSD. It's very easy to prove that. 
uh, you can sort of see that that's true by symmetric. Just take a line, if it's one k is one, it's obviously true, and then by symmetry this is true. Okay. So, for one Gaussian, the best k-dimensional subspace, minimizing mean squared distance to the subspace, is any subspace that passes through the center. What about k Gaussians? Well, that automatically implies that if I had k-spherical Gaussians, with, gen with centers in general position, we don't want them collinear and so on, general position, the unique k-dimensional subspace minimizing mean squared distance is the span of the centers, right? Obvious, because it minimizes individually for each Gaussian, but totally it must minimize them. Okay, so then we're done. We can find the singular vectors of the data matrix, which we have, and that gives you the span of the centers. Okay? And once you have the span of the centers, you're done. Uh, and maybe I want to remark on this. Uh, again, since it's a tutorial, I can spend a minute uh, uh, telling you about dimension reduction. So, what I said then, sorry. So here we did what is standard in PCA. I found the K uh, SVD, the k-dimensional subspace, and projected down to it. That reduced the dimension from D to K, right, and solved the problem. That's what you do, standard PCA technique, right? Uh, how do you uh, reduce the dimension of a problem? There are only two methods that I know which systematically reduce the dimension of problems. One is the random projection method, where you choose a random s-dimensional subspace, in this case it is K, and project to the random subspace. We have the beautiful theorem of Johnson Linden Strauss that guarantees that there's very high concentration of, uh, is, the random variable is the length of the projection, is very highly concentrated about what it should be, which is you get a multiplicative factor of s, which is the dimension you're projecting to, to d. Square root because it's Pythagoras, right? Only the squares scale. But for our problem, this doesn't, random projection will not help. Random projection will scale into center distances as well as standard deviations by the same factor. We're worried about the ratio, it doesn't change. <coughs> and the singular vector method does help you, as we saw for spherical Gaussians. A little later in the talk, I'm going to come back to SVD. It's going to help us very much for, in the general case, without Gaussian assumptions and so on, in a very nice way. Okay. Uh, then, uh, quickly, so, uh, there has been literature, uh, and, and I'm going to show you uh, in fact, most recently, uh, some very nice papers in the last few years by Kalai, Moitra, and Valiant, which get away from the notion that you need intercenter separation, which are a few standard deviations. And already in our paper, we did some of that. Namely, you can do even concentric Gaussians, provided the radii are different, right? You should be able to. If there are two Gaussians of different radii, they're concentric, you can still do it. You can still separate them. No a linear separator anymore, right? You can still separate them. And uh, that's now carried to uh, its climax. It's very nicely, a uh, nice paper of Kalai, Moitra, and Valiant, where they show the following. If I have a mixture of K general Gaussians, not spherical, general Gaussians, and the total variation distance, uh, I won't define this, but the total variation dis distance between any two densities is not very close to zero. And as well as the weight of each thing is not very close to zero, then in fact you can learn it. And the method they use is random projections, even though um, I said random projections don't help in that case, it, it helps in this case. Uh, now, again, the trouble with random projections, and it's probably best to draw a picture. So here is the trouble with random projections. Suppose I have two spherical Gaussians in 3D, and their centers are very close compared to the standard deviation, right? Two flat pancakes. This is to be thought of as two flat pancakes. If I pick a random direction, highly likely they will land on top of each other, right? Only if you pick the direction of the line joining the centers will you distinguish them. All, most directions will not have so much of a component in that, in, that, in that axis, and they will make the two pancakes fall on top of each other, and you're in trouble. How do you avoid that? That's actually a big crucial point in this paper. I may not say anything more about this paper. I want to move on to uh, avoiding stochastic assumptions. Now, I want to do this without stochastic assumptions. So, all the, the, the trouble with Gaussians is that they're so nice, uh, you get a lot of stuff for free, including the tail bounds being really exponentially decaying, which we don't necessarily have in general. So, how do we get out, get out of this? So the first order of business in getting rid of stochastic assumptions is simple. 
What do we do with standard deviation? Standard deviation is intrinsically a stochastic quantity. It is the, uh, well, if it's not spherical, you have to take the maximum standard deviation among all directions. If the square root of the maximum mean squared distance to the mean of the distribution in any direction, right? That's the standard deviation. We get rid of it by having a deterministic quantity that sounds exactly the same, which is the square root of the maximum mean squared distance to the cluster center in any direction. And as soon as I say it, you'll realize that there's a name for it, namely spectral norm, right? So if I take uh, uh, the data matrix, this is a matrix of cluster centers. Each data point is a row. Corresponding to that row, I put down the center of its cluster in C. Its spectral norm, I've scaled by root n because it's mean squared distance and then square root, right? Uh, that plays the role of standard deviation, okay? So you don't have to remember this exact quantity, it's just a spectral norm scaled because I, I took mean squared distance. So no standard deviation anymore, spectral norm. But I'm going to use the same letter sigma for it because otherwise it'll get too confusing. So here is a use of SVD that actually is not difficult to prove the theorem I'm going to state here. It's a fairly simple theorem, but it's a very nice theorem to remember somehow and it probably in some sense is not very well known Although some points I tend to think it should be folklore, but I'm not sure it is folklore. But anyway, so uh, here's a, here's a uh, simple device. So I have a bunch of data points to cluster. I project the data points onto the space generated by the k singular vectors, top k singular vectors of the matrix. For spherical Gaussians, this probably does the job, but now I'm doing it in general. Okay. And now I do any approximate k means clustering of the projected space, and approximate means I can be off by factors of two. I don't care. Within factors of two, I find the best mean squared distance clustering. And the theorem, this should really be theorem zero. And it's really quite simple, believe me. It says the cluster center is so found, or within a few standard deviations, of the centers of the true clustering. I don't know what the true clustering is. In fact, of the centers of any k clustering. Now, how can that be true? Suppose. Uh, how can this be true for bad clusterings as well as good? Well, if you had a very bad clustering, its sigma is very large, right? And so I have a lot of room. If I have a very good clustering, its sigma is small, and the theorem is saying something non-trivial. But it's just true for any clustering. Okay? So project to the SVD subspace and cluster, which you would intuitively think is a good thing to do, this says, in fact, it gets you centers within a few standard deviations of the correct centers. And now, if the inter-center separations is at least a few standard deviations, that's what was the case in my Gaussian picture, then you'll be done. In fact, you can use this to find clustering, which is more or less correct. Okay. Now, this sounds innocuously simple. I want to throw in a word of caution. Uh, the moral uh, was what I think. SVD gives you centers within a few standard deviations, constant number of standard deviations, and nearly the correct clustering challenge. I don't know of any other algorithm which comes within a few standard deviations of the true clustering. Okay? Choosing data points will not do. Remember the sun and planet picture. Any data point is a planet. It's too far, far, far away from the center. Okay? It's not going to be within a few standard deviations. Uh, now, there are very nice attempts, and one of them is called the k-means plus plus, which you will hear. Jess will talk about later, I think. Uh, that uh, th those are faster than SVD, and they try to find good starting centers for k-means. Uh, but no, uh, nothing comes uh, this close. Although you have to pay for it because you have to do SVD. Okay. So uh, I, I guess, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to switch topics for a little bit. This, um, in the talks I gave, earlier, this I call theorem zero. There's a theorem one that I would describe, but I want to postpone that because I want to touch the topic of similarity based clustering. As you'll see, this is not, this is not a comprehensive survey of clustering. I've tried to pick more topics that people in machine learning may not be so familiar with and people in algorithms may be familiar with and vice versa. So uh, it's cute towards that. But I want to now, before I get to theorem one, perhaps if there's time, I want to talk about similarity based clustering. So the, it's a completely different setup now. We have n objects, pairwise similarities, right? Not distances, but similarities. Similarities are all non-negative. Um, we want to partition into perhaps a number of clusters that I don't tell you in advance. 
And I want the clusters with high total intra-cluster similarity. Within cluster similarity should be very high. Inter-cluster similarity should be very low, right? So if, uh, without quantifying these. So if these are your clusters, you will have a lot of similarity here, which I draw by edges and very weak connections between them, between two different clusters. That's what we would like. OK, there's a beautiful algorithm that um, maybe not always correctly attributed. It's really due to Fiedler, a Czech mathematician working in the 60s and 70s, who formulated this algorithm first, I believe. Uh, and this is the second eigenvector algorithm, right? So you normalize row sums to one of the similarity matrix. It becomes a stochastic matrix. Stochastic matrix is just a non-negative matrix with row sums to one. The largest eigenvalue is one, and all ones is the uh, largest eigenvector. And uh, the second eigenvalue is strictly less than one, and the second largest eigenvector is orthogonal to the all, all ones vector. Okay? So the second eigenvector looks like it's orthogonal to the all ones. And uh, if you had a picture, it's nice to have this picture. I was too lazy to draw all these pictures. If your similarity matrix is sort of a block matrix with a lot of stuff here in these blocks and small stuff here, right? That, uh, which is stochastic, the top eigenvector is all ones. The second eigenvector will basically look like all positive entries here and negative entries here. Okay. That suggests, and in this case, I do want to cluster them into this block and this block, right? And I would achieve this if I went by the level sets of the eigenvector. Take all positive components and negative components and cluster them separately. It turns out the best place to split may not be zero, but maybe some other level. And Fiedler formulated this and said, split along some level, whichever is best, and that will give you a good split into two parts. What is a good split uh, as a Venn diagram? So I split into two parts. I want weak connections between them. Right? I want that to be weak. Okay. Partition into two sets uh, of objects based on the level set in uh, Level sets in the second eigenvector. You can prove uh, there's some nice, uh, uh, there's a very nice inequality called Chigas inequality, which tells you, in fact, provably that the connections are weak. The cut is sparse. Okay? And you can find it using eigenvectors. So sparse is cut. The problem of finding the weakest connection. Now I should say what that, I should have said what that is. So let E be the number of edges going across. And V1, V2 be the number of vertices on the two sides. The sparsest cut minimizes the number of edges by the min of V1, V2. Number of edges divided by the smaller side. So it's a relative number of edges going from one side to the other. And a lot of applications and one in image segmentation, which many of you may know by Shi and Molly from the 90s. Now, as far as provable results go on Fiedler's algorithm, uh, Spielman and Tang actually showed that for planar graphs, this actually works. In a way that I won't quantify, this actually provably does something good. Okay, step back one step. Uh, what this is, is a class of algorithms for clustering called recursive clustering. We take the set of n objects, split into two recursively, as long as we find a sparse cut. Sparse cut means that. The number of edges going across must be small relative to the smaller side. Okay? It's called conductance. If you're familiar with stochastic processes, it's the conductance of Markov chain. Okay. So, and stop. You keep doing this. Stop when there is no other cut. Uh, you can ask, is this any good? Can you prove anything about it? It turns out you can. So the recursive clustering algorithm, in fact, always produces a clustering where you don't you're, you're nearly optimal within log factors in two parameters simultaneously. One is the number of edges that go between clusters, which you want to minimize, and the other one is no sparse cut inside a cluster. In both these parameters, you'll be only off by a log factor. I, I won't prove this to you, but just mention that this is a method of charging things. Um, well, I'll leave it at that. 
Okay. I want to introduce one more topic, which um, is um, not often associated with clustering, but really is a very useful tool and perhaps should be something we can remember in the back of our minds when we do clustering. So you're given a graph, and the edges may be similarities. We are only now focusing here on edge or non-edge, similarity or not, right? And so it's just an undirected graph. For two sets of vertices, uh, let's have a piece of notation. E of v, u, w is the number of edges going from u to w. Okay. The problem is, I want to divide the vertex set into k parts so that each part is nearly homogeneous. And I'll tell you what that is by a definition, but first a picture. I want to divide up the vertex set into k parts so that if I look at one pair of parts, there are some edges here, these edges are sort of homogeneously spread out through these parts. So you don't have a picture that has one vertex with lots of edges and others having none. Okay? So each part is homogeneous. It doesn't look like that. More precisely, we want the following. So we want the k part so that I take, so again, the edges between any pair of parts is sort of equally spread out. This is correct and this is wrong, right? And that's what this condition says. I take a sub piece of the ith part, piece of the jth part. I look at the number of edges between them. That better be more or less homogeneously right. What does it mean? This is the total number of edges between the two parts. That's this total. And, and I have this many, this ratio is the correct ratio if it's uniformly spread out. If every vertex gets uniformly the right number of edges, this is the correct ratio, you can be off by a little bit. Okay. So once you've done this partition, you can think of each part as a cluster in the sense everybody in the cluster is sort of homogeneous in its relation to other, other vertices. Okay. Um, Zemmerary actually showed that um, uh, every graph can be partitioned. The famous theorem of Zemmerary, which, which is called the regularity lemma, every graph can be partitioned into a constant number of pieces so that the, that condition is satisfied. Their k is constant depending only on epsilon, but Tim Gower's another famous result that showed that the number of parts is very, very large. It's, it's a tower of twos of height, I think 1 over epsilon to the 10. It looks like this. That's what a tower of twos is. Right? So it's enormously large. Um, how it turns out, uh, with Alan Fries, they showed about 15 years back that in fact we can partition into only one exponential number, still an exponential in epsilon, part, so that some aggregate version of this condition is satisfied. This has been useful, as I said, even though it has a clustering flavor, it's been useful for many other optimization problems rather than clustering. Uh, but I wanted to tell you this as a general, general tool. So that's the end of the um, PDF part. I have a, maybe I shouldn't do the power, well, maybe I'll do the PowerPoint part. There is one more little thing, which is theorem one. So, uh, should I stop or, oh, are there, if there are questions, oh, here's the thing, if there are questions, I will stop. If there are no questions, you'll have to listen to the other slide. So think about, think of good questions. And meanwhile, I'll, I'll see the other slide, and you may be forced to listen to it. Now, why don't you ask some questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I'll write on the board, because I don't see this. Um, so, yeah. So in the example with two pancakes, yeah. uh, I thought you were saying that the recent result cannot be applied? Or? No, okay, it can be applied. What happens with the two pancakes is, it's not, if you take a random projection, you're sunk. But They'll they fall on top of each other. But that's but, what they do. No, they actually put it into isotropic position. So if you put it into isotropic position, the pancake don't look like pancake. So first they do something. First they linear transformation to put the entire thing, you can't put individual things into isotropic position because you don't know them, but you put the entire uh, mixture into isotropic position. And then uh, the assertion is, then a random projection will not squish every pair of pancakes. Some pair of pancakes will be distinct. Anything else? Yeah. Is there, any, is there any attempt of using uh, higher order similarities for clustering? 
So let's say I have these two pairs which can come together. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I know there's these triplets cannot come together or these triplets. Yeah. So that's a good question. So I don't know a lot about it except the, one of the reasons I put up the regularity lemma, in fact, there are generalizations to higher order similarities of the regularity lemma. They are much harder, but there are, there are general theorems that tell you something. That say basically that I can partition the set of objects into pieces so that each piece behaves homogeneously. But, but, but one approach could be to think about hyperedges. One approach could, that, but that is hyperedges. So that is a partition of the vertices of a hypergraph. So that regularity still holds. Um, other than that, uh, well, you know, I mean, okay, so then you can ask whether there's an analog of SVD and so on. In linear algebra, certainly this has been asked for tensors. Uh, there aren't, of course, as nice answers as for linear algebra, but there are some answers. So maybe I should quickly state the theorem one, but without proving anything. Uh, what happened for the Gaussian, then we can state more generally. So now, only deterministic assumption, and this is called proximity, and this is joint work with Amit Kumar at IIT Delhi. So, you cannot cluster, you can only find the true clustering if every data point is close to its own cluster center compared to other cluster centers. But that's too strong. That was the assumption that was too strong. But so here's a data point in D dimensions. Here is the center of one cluster, its own cluster. Here is the center of a different cluster. And what Damit Kumar and I were able to do is that if you assume that this distance, D2, to a different cluster is more by at least a few standard deviations than you can cluster. Okay. Implies you can find the correct clustering. And indeed, what happens in that case is that uh, Lloyd's algorithm converges to, it's a very simple algorithm, Lloyd's algorithm. But you have to start with the SVD centers. If you don't, I don't know of any other way of starting where Lloyd's algorithm will probably converge. So this assumption plus SVD start ensures convergence. Now, I want to remark that in a way the gist of that argument is, this gist of that condition, not the argument, is that if this is D1 and D2, if this is A1 and A2, this condition is much, much weaker than saying A2 is greater than or equal to A1 plus C sigma. So assuming that distance to the true center and false center or differ by a few standard deviations in the whole space is much stronger. That's just Pythagoras theorem. Is much stronger than the assumption that they differ only by a few sigmas in the projection. What happens for Gaussians is that, in fact, this condition is satisfied. They do differ only that much, but in the projection, because it's one-dimensional Gaussian in the projection. It's not true in the d-dimensional space for Gaussians, and so that's a stronger assumption. So we don't make that, we make this assumption, and still it's true that Lloyd's algorithm converges. Okay. So that would be theorem one, uh, more properly stated, but, and also, uh, if you want, I can tell you how the proof goes, but not in this talk. Uh, so yeah. if you are, uh, the similarity matrix has some more structure, let's say the one that is a ring uh, that you have, like long bulk and stuff, uh, then does a uh, weak regularity lemma give you stronger results? Have that two power back to this? I see. Um, it's possible. Yes, a stronger assumption means that you'll assume strongly unique optimal solution. Then is it true? I don't know, actually. So it's worth, worth seeing if that will happen. Then will it give, um, weak regularity already give you a split. Yeah? yeah? So in the case of the mixture model, what's the, what's the best that we... Ah, okay, so I should have said. So there's a lot of literature on learning mi mixture models, of course, in statistics, but also in TCS now. Uh, for Gaussians, 
even non-spherical Gaussians. People are worried about this, for instance, the pancake problem. That is, the earlier papers that I mentioned here assumed separations which are in the order of the maximum standard deviation. But what if you have two pancakes where you want separation only as much as the standard deviation in that direction? Can you do that? The later papers do that for Gaussians. For general densities, that's very difficult. There is a little bit of work on um, heavy tail distributions where you don't even assume a variance. Okay. Now, really the only uh, uh, work known earlier there was coordinate uh, product distributions because that gets to be very difficult. But I mean, there's a, there's a sort of uh, vast amount of literature. And the, I didn't, uh, Balkan, Blum, Wempala, uh, that, that started a series of papers on similarity based clustering where you assume there is a ground truth clustering and how do you find it? Okay. I didn't also survey that in detail. Yeah, mixtures you can dig up. If you dig up this valiant, uh, the latest Kalai valiant uh, Moithra paper, there are references to everything. They have a paper in CACM, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. No, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, okay, that's a good point. I should have made this point that in the Gaussian case, or in most of these distribution cases, if you found the centers, you're down. Why is that? Because if you, and I should have said that, but if, I, if you found the centers, then you can project down to the space of centers. What that buys you is the intercenter separation is the same as the big space, right? But standard deviations have come down. If it's Gaussian, you've got a k-dimensional Gaussian instead of uh, whatever the standard deviation. I'm sorry, standard deviations haven't come down. The radius has come down. The standard deviation is still the same in each direction, but it's only k directions instead of d. So indeed, the problem is to find the centers. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank you.